So, very warm welcome from my side as well. Good morning, I think I must say, although this is almost late afternoon in Germany. And uh, well, it's always great to have people from all over the world being connected through digital meetings. So I really start to like it. Very good to, to have you all together. Very good that we are joining us uh, all together on this exciting topic. I mean, so many things are, are going on around hydrogen and what we call power fuels. I'll get back to that in a moment. In, in Germany, we have this hydrogen strategy, the European Union, in, in Canada, there is one, and in Quebec, they're working on it. And I wonder what Joe Biden will be doing soon. I think my team counted, there are more than 50 um, national hydrogen strategies all over the world. Now the question is, how do we do, how do we make the best out of it? And uh, that's one of the tasks uh, we try to, to work on. It's a German energy agency where I come from, but I, I tell you a bit more in, in a minute about this. Well, this workshop is organized by the Global Alliance Power Fuels, which is a project of the German energy agency, but then also um, with our partners, Secteur de la Transition Energétique, and um, with the Green Hydrogen Coalition. You will get to know them later on if you don't know them already. They're great partners, and thank you very much for, for, for joining us. Workshop on power fuels in North America. The Global Alliance Power Fuels did some workshops before. In 2019, it was South Africa. 2020, uh, it was in North with Australian people. And uh, wherever we talk about these issues, we find that there is um, great interest in increasing the global network for, for this topic. And this is very important because in whatever strategy you look, some depend on getting power fuels and some depend on exporting power fuels. And now it's up to us to bring this together and that is not really easy as we will probably discuss later on. Let's go to the next slide, please. Well, the Global Alliance Power Fuels, so what are we actually doing? Um, at the German Energy Agency, where I am CEO, which is a company which is owned by the government, actually. So we're very much working together with the government, but also with lots of industrial partners. Uh, we found out that there won't be a world where we reach climate targets only with electrons. So we need molecules for specific reasons. And um, these molecules will probably be based on hydrogen. And there are so many, um, so many topics you could talk about. And so we were very early working on all these issues with many, many partners. And then we decided, well, we have to, to, to move forward. We have to create this global alliance um, to, to get this global network. We want to raise awareness and acceptance of power fuels, which we think might be a missing link to really reaching the global climate targets. We also want to support the further enhancement of regulatory frameworks. Now, this is important. Now, there won't be a market if we don't have rules. But how would these rules look like at the end? Stimulate project development globally to enable production capacities on an industrial scale. So these are the main targets, actually, and we are working on. And we do operate as well, some kind of a think tank, also as a network, an information hub. Um, identifying challenges, and barriers, and talk about concrete things. So what we bring with us is some yeah, concrete view on, on problems, on, on challenges, but also on options and possibilities. Maybe we can go to the next slide, please. So these are the main partners at the moment um, we are working with in our global network. As I said, we are always increasing it uh, and we have many other events and meetings um, behind this network and, and, and contact persons. The Alliance's International Partners Network is a collaboration among global initiatives as well. So think tanks, initiatives, associations, research institutions, very important for us to further enhance the discussion and development of power fuels globally, all whilst acting in line with overall goals. 
So it's also something for better understanding. The next slide, please. Now, I mean, I could talk for an hour about this slide, but I, I guess you all know this. Um, what are power fuels? Our definition of power fuels embraces a broad range of technologies, including, of course, hydrogen, synthetic gas, methane, propane, as well as synthetic liquid fuels and chemicals. And chemicals are very important. We just made a huge study, or not a huge study, like a, a nice study with the university from, the, uh, from, from, from Finland, from LTU, and uh, where we, have, we try to have a global perspective on well, on what would we need at the end, and we included the chemical issue over there. Not many studies are doing that so far, so far but I think we, we think this is a very important aspect of um, hydrogen and, and, and power fuels. Let's, let's move on with the slides. So, well, I'm happy to announce the second annual power fuels conference in June 20, um, when is it? 21, yes, and it will be held on the 23rd of June in an online format again. Uh, and these conferences, are of course, also again, very helpful, where we again bring different people together. So if you want to know more about this full day, day event and the program and everything, um, please uh, talk to, to my team later on. This is also a conference where we partner with the Renewable Energy Hamburg cluster. So we, you certainly can expect interesting insights into this development of the power fuels hub in Hamburg. And um, yeah, that's just a little first um, reminder for something else which might be happening soon. And I hope you're interested. Let's go to the next slide. Well, that's the agenda for today. Two great keynotes in a moment, and then panel discussions, power fuels projects in North America and Europe. We have breakout sessions. Um, well, we'll followed by discussions in small groups and summaries in, summary and Q&A. We try to keep it dense because we know that, um, well, watching into a screen like all day, as you probably all do, is sometimes a bit uh, nasty. But nevertheless, on the other hand, it helps us to really, um, to really um, work in these breakout sessions. So I hope you will find it efficient at the end. Next slide. So here again, uh, our partners for this conference, and thank you again very, very much. Secteur de la Transition Energétique is part of the Ministry of Energy and Resources, or the, the, the right name, yeah, yeah, Natural Resources, and uh, the Department for the Advancement of the Energy Transition is in the Ministry of Energy in Quebec. So it's a perfect partner for us. It sounds like a very similar um, agency or, or, or partner doing similar things as we do in Germany, of course. Um, so we are very happy to have you as a cooperation partner for, for, for quite a while as well. And um, there will be many opportunities to work on this German-Canadian partnership as well, I, I would say. Green Hydrogen Coalition, founded in 2019, is an educational nonprofit organization, um, focuses on building top-down momentum for scalable green hydrogen projects that leverage multi-sector opportunities to simultaneously scale supply and demand. So the work is supported, as I understand, by annual charitable donations from supporting companies, staffed by Strategen, and we will hear from them in a, in a moment, consulting company on the field of renewable energy and, uh, and energy transition, well, and so on and so on. So you can see, very valuable partners. And um, well, that should just have been my little introduction for the moment, because we want to start, as I said, with two keynotes. And the first, well, maybe next slide, please. And for these uh, keynotes, we have uh, Janice Lin and Mathieu Payeur. And Janice is founder and CEO of Strategen, founder and president Green Hydrogen Coalition. So she really achieved something big, and I'm very curious uh, of what she's going to tell us uh, in a moment. Um, more, I think more than 25 years of strategic experience in the topic of renewable energy and energy storage. And I, I, I want to highlight this because this is very important. In Germany, we do have this discussion about all the colors of hydrogen. Well, I myself, I'm very open for all the colors of hydrogen because I don't see some policemen uh, standing at the frontiers 
and asking the hydrogen which color uh, it has, whether it is blue or green or yellow or whatever it might be, we want to take care of it should be as climate neutral as possible. That's uh, our obligation. But renewables will be the fundament, the, the, the basis of everything what we're going to do in, in, in climate policies and having experience with uh, renewables is certainly helpful. And I will introduce Mathieu in a moment, but I think um, for the, for now I, I leave it um, I, I leave it here and, and give uh, the screen to Janice. Is that okay? Thank you, Andreas. It's really an honor to be joining you today. I'm uh, going to share my screen here. So um, I want to take you all back to 2009. I had just finished a meeting with Dr. Michael Starner, a Fraunhofer scientist who I am sure many of you know. He came to my downtown Berkeley office and he shared a vision about how wind and solar would be used to create unlimited amounts of hydrogen to decarbonize Europe's gas pipelines, the power sector, the transportation sector and industrial sectors. He called it power to X. At that time, remember this is 2009, I was just launching the California Energy Storage Alliance and educating my constituents about the difference between a megawatt hour and a megabyte. I, I kid you not, this, it was very early. And how maybe someday batteries could be used to help balance the grid. Wow, I thought. That is such a big vision, this power to X thing. And that's about the kookiest thing I've ever heard. There is no way that is ever gonna happen, I thought to myself. <laughs> Here we are 12 years later, and I just wanna say, thank you, Germany. Thank you, Dr. Starner. Thank you for your leadership in power fuels and decarbonization. Today, Dr. Starner is one of my personal heroes. I haven't had a chance to tell him that in person. And I'm so honored to be one of two local co-hosts of today's workshop as an advocate of green hydrogen and in particular, power to X. I am living proof that things can change here in the United States. And I'm here to talk about what we're doing to make that change happen faster. So really quickly about the GHC and thank you for that introduction and overview, Andreas. Um, we are an educational nonprofit founded very recently in 2000, uh, the fall of 2019. And our approach, um, I would say, is very focused and a little different from other hydrogen organizations here in North America, in that we are prioritizing green hydrogen project development at scale to advance the production and use of green hydrogen simultaneously. Our focus and approach is um, really to collaborate and uh, really co collaboration is the foundation of accelerated progress. And why do we do this? I always like to remind folks about the urgency. You know, urgency for action has never been greater. The impacts of climate change are no longer theoretical. Uh, this picture um, was what my home state of California looked like for much of the fall of the last three years. Rising seas, drought, and severe weather has become the norm, driving the displacement of millions of people, creating unbelievable suffering. I love this quote from Antonio Guterres because it puts the onus on us and the possibility to affect a different outcome for our children and our children's children. We are indeed at a defining moment in time. So you may be asking, right, I get it, the urgency of climate change, but why does the world need another hydrogen nonprofit? So a little bit more about the GHC. Like many of you, we are focused on accelerating green hydrogen hub development. And I love that um, the theme for your June conference. The GHC was launched in 2019 in partnership with the US's largest municipal utility, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. They're the largest off-taker of this 
beautiful 1800 megawatt coal, fi coal fired generator located in central Utah, which will be converted to an 840 megawatt combined cycle gas hydrogen gas turbine. A big part of our core effort is to establish an appropriate legal and regulatory framework in California to enable this conversion. We also realize that to achieve our at scale delivered cost targets, the green hydrogen economy must be regionally planned and supported. That's why we have our two additional initiatives. The first called the Western Green Hydrogen Initiative fosters state and provincial level government coordination on green hydrogen infrastructure development. It's an amazing partnership between the GHC, NASIO and the Western Interstate Energy Board and because Canada is the other co-host, we are partnered with uh, Alberta and British Columbia. The second initiative is focused on regional ecosystem development, High Deal North America. It's our commercialization platform that will drive regional hydrogen ecosystem development at scale. I'll talk briefly about each of these focus areas in turn, starting with IPP. As I said, this is my favorite coal plant, no kidding. So much so that uh, my new husband and I visited this coal plant on our honeymoon, the summer of 2019. We believe the fastest pathway to scaling green hydrogen production and use here in the United States is through power to gas to power. And IPP is showing us how. IPP is the largest green hydrogen project under development in North America today. It should definitely be added to the Global Alliance Power Fuels online map. When it's fully converted to 100% green hydrogen, this single generator will require 277 million kilograms of green hydrogen per year. IPP is blessed with abundant resources to enable this vision to come to fruition. First of all, it has a motivated and very bankable long-term off-taker, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. It's also blessed with abundant nearby renewable electricity, ample transmission capacity, land, water rights, sits on top of the Western United States largest salt dome formation, and it has an incredible skilled workforce. To support this conversion, there is much foundational policy and regulatory work that needs to be done. Similar to how the energy regulatory rules needed to be modified to incorporate battery storage we now have to do the same for green hydrogen. It starts with a healthy foundation, a broad technology agnostic definition, roadmaps. We have a lot of road mapping to catch up with all of you. That road mapping is so important to facilitate multi-agency jurisdictional coordination, coordination. Existing regulatory proceedings, such as our integrated resource planning uh, program and our resource adequacy dockets, IRP and RA, for example, must be modified to include green hydrogen into their planning and procurement toolkit. These are the mechanisms by which green hydrogen projects can be compensated. Ultimately, we see California with its abundant local resources and advantageous coastal position participating as a global exporter of low cost green hydrogen. This of course will require repurposing and building lots of new infrastructure. And that's why we have the Western Green Hydrogen Initiative. We also call it WIGI. To achieve really low delivered cost, the green hydrogen economy must take advantage of regional resources. Infrastructure costs are best shared by a much larger pool of users. It's for this reason that we launched the Western Green Hydrogen Initiative. WIGI is a public-private partnership to advance and accelerate deployment of green hydrogen infrastructure in the West. Our work was so exciting that three states, Louisiana, Florida, and Ohio also jumped on board. One of my favorite sayings is what you focus on is what you get. Wiki is creating the platform for state and provincial leadership to focus on regional green hydrogen infrastructure development at scale. And it is truly state-led, state and province-led Montana and Nevada are chairing, and California and Utah serve as vice chairs. The leadership, momentum, and excitement that has been created is infectious. Here are the priorities. We have a couple of convenings under our belt. 
The WIGI states and provinces have identified the following priorities. Modeling and analysis, in particular, how to optimize existing gas and electric infrastructure to achieve greater reliability in the West. Regulations and best practices, coordinated regional strategy and road mapping and coordinated hub development. Speaking of hub development, we couldn't agree more that that is the pathway to realizing the green hydrogen economy. That brings me to our second initiative, High Deal North America. Following the successful model created by High Deal Ambition in Europe, which was founded by one of the GHC's board members, Thierry Leperc. High Deal North America is accelerating green hydrogen at scale by aggregating key ecosystem stakeholders, particularly multi-sectoral offtakers in strategically targeted locations to plan and develop the competitive high volume supply chain necessary to achieve $1.50 per kilogram delivered for large offtakers. In our fall meeting, the GHC identified two regional priority areas in the Western US, the LA Basin and the Wasatch Front largely because there are very significant, large high volume offtakers in these locations and abundant green hydrogen production resources. Stay tuned for some exciting new announcements about High Deal North America coming soon. Finally, I wanna close with a couple of final takeaways that I learned while working on market development for energy storage. We need to approach market development with the correct mindset. Sure, we must drive down cost, but we must also be open to recognizing and valuing all the benefits. At the end of the day, it's about maximizing and comparing net benefits, not just cost, when considering green hydrogen as an alternative to a status quo fossil fuel solution, regardless of the application. And finally, most importantly, we must, must, must harness the human capital that we have today. Here in this meeting, thank you, uh, Dina, thank you, Global Alliance Power, Power Fuels, um, because that's exactly what you're doing and what you're all about. I'll end with one of my favorite quotes from Margaret Mead, a famous social anthropologist. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Jenny, that was excellent. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I, I really, I really like this, uh, and I, I must say, uh, I, I like the spirit uh, of of the way you're talking about this as well. Uh, you know, it's 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 both. So we have to have our hands in the sky, but also our feet on the ground. And uh, but I think both is both is important here. So thank you very much, and I will certainly say hi to Michael if I see him next time. But may I, may I ask you? Uh, a question. Well, we know California as a region where they very much focus on direct use of electricity. That's our impression. But now it sounds as if they are probably also pretty open for hydrogen issues and molecules. Is that is that true? I mean, do you see real openness over there? And could you recommend a speaker for our next dinner convention? whom we could invite to, to tell us that both things are necessary. Um, so the last question, absolutely, I'm happy to help. Um, we do have quite a few champions for green hydrogen that really recognize the important role that hydrogen can play in decarbonizing, uh, not only fully decarbonizing our power sector, but also many other sectors. And uh, yes, I, I think of California as um, a key champion, there's many stakeholders here, <laughs> so it's a complicated place, a key champion of electrification. And with some of those stakeholders, I like to um, talk to them about how hydrogen is a pathway to electrifying our fuel supply. It is, one, of course, uh, renewable electricity is only one way of many ways to make green hydrogen. We support all of the above. And uh, so, um, yeah, expect some very exciting news to come out of um, my home state shortly. <laughs> well, there is no opposition between one direction and the other direction. They try to put it all together. Sure, okay, all yeah. right. And uh, so, and, and uh, you, do you think that, um, maybe just a quick, quick last question, do you think that, I mean, it will spread around the US somehow so that the, the, the 
there might be also a US hydrogen strategy coming up? Yes, I didn't talk about that, but we are um, very excited mm -hmm. about the Biden administration's plan. Uh, Secretary Granholm just announced a goal uh, to reduce the cost of green renewable hydrogen by 80% uh, within a very short period of time. And I can share with you from our work with uh, these 14 states uh, here in the United States, and they're about as diverse as you can come. California, Utah, Montana, Idaho, Louisiana, Florida. I mean, these are very politically diverse states, all with different agendas, uh, different, different beliefs even about climate. And if there's one thing that's very exciting is they all agree that there is something very exciting about green hydrogen. It represents tremendous opportunity, opportunity to either um, accelerate our fight against climate change or accelerate economic development. And they all agree that collaboration is key to making progress more rapidly. I find this very, very encouraging. Well, yeah, share information you have with us. We would very much like this. Janice, thank you again very, very much. Uh, and now I will ask uh, Monsieur Payeur um, for the next keynote uh, input. Uh, he's Director Energy Strategies uh, in the Secteur de la Transition Energétique. And uh, yeah, the other partner we have for today, and as I understand from your CV, Monsieur, you work, you have lots of experience in all or fields of, of, of energy and also a more holistic approach as well. No? You worked on energy efficiency for more than a decade. You're director for partnerships and also now a director for energy strategies. And um, my team told me that you are especially interested in energy systems as a whole. And uh, well, I think that's a very helpful approach because we, we have to learn to bring all these different technologies together and see how they interact and how we can get the most value out of it. So I'm very curious to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much, Andreas. And uh, yeah, so you, you, you point out the right elements in my, in my perspective. Uh, there's the need to, to have more analysis and, and tools to identify the right scenarios where we can mix uh, all of the uh, different strategies in, in combination and, and not uh, have some confrontation between the technology, technological options. So let me share my screen here. So can you see the screen now? Just want to make sure. Yes, okay, good. Yes. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here today and discuss about uh, and learn more about power fuels uh, a common um, subject of interest, of, of course, for all of the, the participants in the uh, in the workshop. So we've been in, in collaboration with Dina uh, for quite some time now about hydrogen and energy efficiency. And the overall aspect I wanted to give you is, well, what's the perspective of uh, uh, a jurisdiction such as Quebec, which is in, in Canada, of course, but what are the specific needs for Quebec to uh, achieve its energy transition? Uh, this is basically what we're trying to achieve. And for most of you uh, already know, uh, in Quebec, we do have a lot of green electricity already. So one can wonder, well, what's the place for hydrogen and power flows in this context? And if you allow me, I'll, I'll get you into a little bit more details about our specific energy context so you can see uh, the uh, the interest of these uh, subject. So if we look at the overall consumption in, in the province of Quebec, well, uh, this is a rel in relative terms. We see uh, that there is, well, first of all, we're great consumers of energy in North America. Uh, if we compare ourselves to Germany, uh, it's basically the double what you're consuming in, uh, in Germany, in Quebec. And even when we compare ourselves with uh, the average in Canada, we see that, well, the consumption is quite the same, but the, the type of, of sector that we're, where we're using this energy is different. So we're using a little bit more in the industry side uh, and a little bit less in the transport in Quebec uh, when we compare with Canada. So going a little bit into uh, a little bit more into the depth of our consumption pro uh, profile, we see that I would say about 60% uh, of the total energy that's consumed in Quebec is used in the industry and the transport side. 
And uh, of course, this is not a big, um, a big um, surprise here, but one can wonder, well, what type of energy do you use? Well, we do use a lot of electricity, which is 99 plus uh, renewable here in Quebec. So it's a, we're, it's a great blessing. But still, uh, we can admit that more than 40% of the total consumption in Quebec is uh, petroleum products. So this is, this is pointing out that the, the issue of the uh, climate change crisis and the fight that we were doing to climate change uh, comes down to the energy aspect of things. Because in Quebec, uh, about 70% of the total GHG emissions are related to energy. Going a little bit more into the details once more uh, about where do we use this energy? Well, we see that the petroleum products are consumed in the transport sector for 82% of the total petroleum is consumed uh, in this sector, which represents also 45% of all of the GHG emissions. So uh, there's a lot to be done, but when we think about technology, of course, we're leading for the electrification of uh, light duty vehicles. We want to go ahead uh, and electrify as much as possible everything that has to do with mobility, but there's some technical and economical constraint as you all know. So how, how can we achieve that? How can we achieve this energy transition we're trying to, to do? So remove all of the fossil fuel and go into the renewable side. This is where you need a strategy. And in Quebec, uh, we're, we're happy to say that there's a lot of will to go ahead and move uh, and, and act on climate change and energy transition. So by the end of last year, uh, the government uh, of Quebec uh, announced its new plan for a green economy, which is uh, uh, mentioning once again, its will to uh, uh, reduce by 37.5% the total GHG emissions in 2030, when we compare ourselves to 1990. And of course, being that a lot of the GHGs here in Quebec are related to energy, well, there's a strong will to act on the energy and there's a need for energy specific targets. One of which is to reduce by 40% the total petroleum product uh, that we're consuming. So in 2030, in comparison to 2013, so this is quite significant, knowing now that uh, it's basically in the transport sector uh, uh, for the most part that we do have to act. So continuing, uh, there's a need for a plan as well. So this is basically our role in the government uh, at our ministry to, to provide the master plan in energy transition where uh, you, you, uh, we provide a, a global, um, uh, vision of all of the measures that has to be uh, taking into account and as, as, as to be deployed uh, to get to the energy uh, transition target that we're looking for. So this is our role. We're working with all of the ministries and the energy utilities in Quebec here mm -hmm. to provide some guidance there. One of the major element of the uh, strategy, of course, either for GHG reduction and energy transition, which can be the same in some way, uh, is to prioritize electrification, direct electrification, because we do have all of this green electricity already available. Um, but still on a technical and even on an economical level, there's some issues, there's some barriers, there's not enough electricity, there's the peak demand issues. So we need to innovate, we need to think about uh, new ways to uh, move forward. And once more, we have to think that uh, there is a, a clock ticking. So we have to get these targets and we have to accelerate the overall process. So this is where hydrogen comes in. So, um, so pretty, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure everyone knows uh, that it's possible from green electricity to produce green hydrogen. And once we have this green hydrogen, well, there's a lot to be done with it, as you may know. Uh, there are some direct application that we can use uh, fuel cell applications, but there's also indirect applications. And basically what, what that means is that uh, for the energy transition to occur, hydrogen can play a major role there. Uh, it can help us to hydrically uh, electrify what we cannot electrify directly, uh, which would make sense. So uh, as a, a second wave, but 
it also helps us to accelerate the overall energy transition process. And this is really where we want to uh, act to make sure that uh, the, the ball is rolling in quickly. So in, in this aspect, the government, our government is producing at this very moment, uh, green hydrogen and bioenergy, a strategy, which should be published by the end of the year uh, in, two, in 2021. The objective here is to look at uh, the place of hydrogen and bioenergy in the overall energy transition, but also in the GHG fighting uh, uh, action. Um, we're looking to uh, remove fossil fuel, of course, but there's a will also to look at the complementary between hydrogen, bioenergy, and electricity in direct electrification, uh, and to see, well, what's the right energy and where does it go? So basically, there's some little bit limited uh, capacity for producing uh, natural uh, renewable natural gas, for instance, or uh, green electricity. So we have to do act on energy efficiency to remo to reduce as much as possible the consumption. But once there's this reduced consumption, well, how can we move that into uh, renewable energy? Uh, so in a nutshell, uh, two basic questions. Why should we look at power fuels and hydrogen? Well, basically because the time is ticking. Uh, we need to act fast and we need to multiply the technical, technological options to help us uh, achieve this energy transition. We need to, of course, uh, do a lot more on energy efficiency and we have to accelerate the electrification process. So to do so, we need to to use uh, kilowatt hours, but also other means uh, that could be uh, more indirect. So there's a, 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 a great need for policies and governmental, strong governmental action on many of the uh, different fronts. So there's, there's a need to get some decision tools, as we mentioned already, to define the best scenarios, the most economical and the most uh, feasible uh, scenarios that we can um, put into place. There's a will to act on uh, research and innovation, of course, but also on the behavior of the people. And finally, well, there's a need, of course, for financial support. Uh, there's a, we do have a lot of incentive programs already, and there's the cap and trade system that uh, we have here in Quebec in collaboration with California. Uh, and so we all, we all need uh, these, these um, actions and these scenarios which should be region specific because the energy context is quite specific to each of the regions. But basically, we're all going in the same direction. And I think there's a lot to be shared here. So, uh, so that concludes my brief presentation. Uh, I'm pretty, uh, I, once again, I'm really glad to be here with you. And I have, I have to, uh, to thank um, uh, Dina for its leadership in, the, in this powerful alliance approach and all the work that you're doing on hydrogen we do uh, um, we do appreciate greatly the partnership that we have with uh, with Dina thank you thank you thank you Matthew thank you for for the compliments and for the cooperation uh, which will last for a while I guess uh, and uh, thank you for this great presentation I mean it's a very focused um, project you're working on developing this this hydrogen strategy for Quebec that sounds very familiar to many thoughts we, we did have uh, in Germany, and there will be many things we, we, we can discuss here uh, later on. Thank you very, very much. Just one quick question, because we have to, to, to move on. I mean, if you're talking about transport, um, then you also need to talk about partnering with car industry and, and things like that. Is that an important part of your agenda, bringing the, all the right people uh, on the at the table? Yeah, so, so of course, there's a lot of partnership to be done, uh, but still, the, the, the first part will, would be to look at what is the best strategy. And one of the major issues we have with transport is, of course, with heavy duty side uh, and logistics, uh, because there's a lot of, of uh, interest for uh, battery electric vehicles in the light duty side. But uh, there's, no, there's no real uh, solution at this very moment on, on the commercial level. Uh, to to go ahead and electrify the uh, other aspects. So there's a, a need to collaborate and discuss about the best scenarios once again. Um, and it's I don't think there's going to be one uh, specific scenario. It's going to be a hybrid kind of solution where some some possibilities uh, would work in some cases 
and in others that don't uh, in others. So. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank that. you very much. Uh, great, great input. I think we have a good fundament for uh, the next things coming up. And I will uh, give the screen to Kilian Kono, who is kind of managing the whole Global Alliance Power Fuels. And he will uh, lead us through the next steps here. Kilian, where are you? Oh, there he is. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Andreas, uh, for, for moderating the first uh, keynotes. And those, I think, have been very interesting insights on the more strategic level of, uh, and also with Andreas, your remarks on what the, the differences and similarities are in, in the European discussion and the North American discussion at the moment. But uh, despite all the talk on hydrogen and power fuels and the importance that we've established and the necessity for it in becoming climate neutral on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, I think talk in the last uh, two years hasn't been enough and we've moved into projects. The global project pipeline I learned on Tuesday from Arena is around uh, 60 to 140 gigawatts right now. So projects are being planned. Um, and in fact, the best locations for projects in the North American continent, according to some calculations for wind and PV data, are in two regions. And guess which regions those are? It's California and the offshore wind regions of Quebec. So I think we have the right people here today uh, to discuss about what makes good and viable projects for power fuels happen and also what kind of framework conditions do we need? Um, I would like to introduce the panelists uh, in a moment. Um, we've uh, managed a yeah, very, broad, uh, very broad set of speakers from, from industry. We have uh, Jean Paquin, president and CEO of the CEF Plus Consortium, working on sustainable aviation fuels, power fuels in Quebec. We have Hannes Stukas, uh, VP of Business Development from Carbon Engineering firm, most of you might know it, working on direct air capture, CO2 removal for storage or use uh, from the atmosphere. Chris Norris, Director of Business Development, Hydrogen from Siemens Energy in Canada, electrolyzer manufacturer amongst others, um, but also I think uh, knowledgeable in other parts of the energy system. And Dr. Tamit Nizan, Manager Global Strategy and Regulatory Affairs from ExxonMobil, um, working on a lot of their um, yeah, energy transition efforts. Um, I would, uh, without any further ado, um, move right into the panel and ask you, Jean, uh, in three to five minutes to give us an overview of which kind of projects are you working on with the CEF Plus Consortium, um, and then uh, ask the uh, speakers to join. We are a bit short on time, but uh, we do want to have a little bit of discussion afterwards, so uh, I'll keep the introduction short. Jean, are you ready? I'm always ready. Thank you very much, uh, Killian. Really appreciate that. Uh, well, thank you very much for um, inviting us uh, to this panel, uh, to this uh, wonderful and great conference, which, um, which is really focused on, on what uh, we're doing. Um, I'm replacing uh, Alex, who is uh, currently uh, doing a lot of uh, factory uh, testing right now and is putting together our pilot project um, uh, for uh, this uh, summer. So in a nutshell, um, would you want me to use the presentation to do that or just uh, verbally talk about the company? What's uh, best for you? I think presentation works fine. Yeah. Um, okay. I can do that right away. So here's the presentation. Um, in a nutshell, the uh, SAF uh, consortium hovers uh, uh, um, on the, uh, the basis and the, the, the thought that uh, we need to build, uh, we need to break a paradigm. We need to uh, uh, work um, uh, solutions that uh, go uh, somehow against um, uh, against the conventional and, and break the conventional into uh, building a, a new energy, uh, a low carbon value chain. And in our case, uh, we are, uh, of course, in the sustainable aviation uh, sector and fuel. We come originally from uh, the aviation sector. We're experts in the avi aviation sector. We've been uh, uh, expert, uh, bringing that expertise to the uh, ICAO um, uh, development and uh, teams for, for many years uh, and were part of the CORSIA, the standards, for those of you who don't know, that's the standards for carbon offsetting in the, for the aviation industry. So we, we come from that aviation sector and we understand very well the, um, also the, the chemical technical portion of the, of the uh, fuel and uh, sustainable uh, project development uh, uh, portion of, 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 the, uh, of the equation. So um, we 
don't want to, of course, rely only on uh, biofuels and offset. We're seeing right now with the partners that we have around the table that uh, biofuels are, are a great, uh, uh, great option. Uh, however, on, on some fronts, they might um, be um, having issues or um, a little um, uh, offtake uh, needs and, and agreements uh, standards that 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 might um, uh, be uh, going against the uh, the feedstock options and uh, opportunities, and uh, we also have in the past seen uh, many of the uh, projects uh, that we've developed uh, having a little bit of uh, issues with uh, uh, social pushback. So we believed uh, when we started with the project that starting and going into the PTL uh, from a, a, a CO2 capture. Uh, was uh, one of the most beneficial and long-term viable route uh, for us and a good uh, um, a solution for uh, uh, decarbonizing the industry. So power to liquid technology is the key for us to, to meet our goal. The, um, I'll jump right away to the actual, to the, to the project since I don't have a lot of time. Um, we've had um, um, an approach from the beginning that, and that's what we're called a consortium, where we wanted to put around the table um, all the actors of the industry. So we, we, we just didn't want to go in the back, uh, in the back office or in, in a, a department, research department, and just do our, our technical uh, research, but wanted from the beginning to involve all the important actors of the industry. And that involves, of course, uh, in the aviation sector, uh, an airline company, in this case, Air Transat. It also involves uh, uh, airport and, and other uh, subsidiaries of the airport. So we're, we're members and, and uh, partners with uh, Aéroport de Montréal, ADM. And we've also uh, wanted to work the technical uh, portion and the research and development portion of, the, of our project because uh, for some of you who know the uh, the Fisher Trope route, that's of course technology that has been around for many years. Uh, but there's there's room for optimization, there's room for uh, development, and there's room for for improvement. And that is what we're doing with uh, with uh, the government of Canada. That's what we're doing with uh, various uh, academic uh, participants, such as the uh, Ecole Polytechnique, etc. So. Uh, we've worked around expertise so that we would really challenge all of our stakeholders to tell us what was the best option, what was the best route, what was the requirement for a long-term uh, solution that was going to be uh, applicable and easily uh, mergeable and insertable in, 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 this, uh, in this sector. Um, so from uh, the perspective of the project, and I'll just uh, jump right away to it, uh, it's a life uh, cycle, of course, uh, a gas emission reduction where you've got direct capture from a smokestack uh, of the CO2 and the emissions. Uh, and you have, and of course, I really like to hear uh, Mathieu, um, I think it was Mathieu Payer was saying, uh, talking about the, the hydrogen and the uh, green hydrogen in Quebec. And of course, we're fortunate enough to have this wonderful energy uh, mix uh, renewable that is uh, almost 100% renewable. Uh, and, 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 and what better use, what better option for us to develop this project in, in Montreal, uh, in the east end of Montreal, where old, and, and this is the break of paradigm here, where old and, and, uh, and conventional fuel and gas industry could be replaced for uh, and with uh, SAF and sustainable aviation that could reduce uh, the carbon uh, footprint by as much as 80%. Uh, so... Our project is a drop-in uh, solution. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with aviation, uh, the system and distribution of the uh, kerosene, the jet fuel, is done directly into the airplane uh, main uh, hub. So there's a hub of distribution. It's not as if you're delivering uh, a fuel directly to each airplane. Each company buy a portion of the fuel. So our solution is a drop-in solution where the uh, molecule of the SAF, a sustainable synthetic jet fuel produced, uh, will be essentially uh, a, 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 a identical, identical in all uh, prior in all um, in all uh, properties. Uh, chemical properties as a uh, conventional uh, jet fuel type A. So it will be dropped in into the system and mixed in the system. So eventually um, all airlines will actually benefit from it, uh, uh, from, from uh, sustainable aviation fuel production. Again, drop in uh, production, 80% uh, uh, reduction in fuel uh, footprint. 
Uh, the proven technology, we've, uh, this technology has been around for, for years, been proven in Germany, uh, in South Africa, uh, and has been used, uh, uh, it, it's, been, it's been demonstrated to be extremely efficient. Um, a high production, we will be producing um, a pre-commercial project in 2025 and a commercial project by 2030, uh, 30 million liters per year. Um, in uh, Quebec, uh, of course, and uh, of course, cost competitive. We've, uh, this is always the issue, and I've, I've known you've, you've challenged us on what were our wish list and our, our issues. Uh, one of the issue, of course, is that the sector has to understand there's a premium that's gonna have to be paid on, on top of the uh, conventional fuel, and you can't compare uh, both fuels as, as we go along. Uh, there is a price to pay in, in, in cleaning the industry. So as I said, pre-commercial plant, uh, 3 million liters will be by 2025. We're located in the East End Montreal. Uh, that is a very convenient con uh, uh, location for us because uh, there is a actual and current installation. So the facilities and the power um, and needed required for the systems are already in place. And we are uh, very, very close to the uh, manifold, the drop in manifold for the distribution of the one of the largest uh, uh, distribution, uh, fuel distribution hub in uh, North America. John, so, I'm sorry yeah. to um, remind you of the time. We had about I'm seven just, minutes. I'm just finalizing. That's it. That's it for me. So I'm just saying thank you. Uh, for uh, telling, for following us uh, on our project development, and uh, I wish I could be a part of this. Uh, we can be part of uh, this great endeavor that you're putting forward. Really appreciate again having been invited on this uh, on this uh, conference. Thank you, Jean. Excellent uh, introduction, and I think that uh, what you showed uh, already raises the question: How can maybe also other countries and regions benefit from that? potentially use uh, those fuels also to credit uh, in, in their regions and flights. Um, as much as the question of where does the carbon come from, you now uh, mentioned a very scalable source, but very, one that's in Europe at least controversially discussed, that is industrial flue gases. We might touch upon that later, but we'll now um, go over to our second speaker who um, has probably her own perspective on that. That's Anna Stukas, a VP Business Development from Carbon Engineering. Anna. I understand you have a background in, in engineering and technology. Um, looking forward to hearing your thoughts as well uh, on what makes a successful project. And uh, as Jean put it, um, I'm going to challenge you on what is your wish list as well towards policy make. So carbon engineering's core expertise is the ability to capture carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere. Uh, and once you've captured that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you can do uh, one of a number of things with them, but the two most scalable uh, options, oh, I'm perfect. I, two of the most scalable opportunities that you have for utilizing this atmospheric carbon dioxide are first, you can essentially put it back underground where it came from. What that does is it allows you a very powerful tool to eliminate any emission of any type from anywhere and any point in time. So it not only allows us a solution to decarbonize hard to abate sectors, it will also allow us to go back and capture uh, the additional 800 billion tons of carbon dioxide that are in excess in the atmosphere that we need to remove to put the atmosphere back into balance. The second piece that our technology enables uh, and what we're here to talk about today is the ability to create drop-in compatible renewable synthetic fuels uh, by combining that atmospheric carbon dioxide with low carbon intensity uh, hydrogen. So why make your power fuels from atmospheric carbon? Well, one of the key reasons to do this is because atmospheric carbon dioxide provides you with a path that is net zero aligned. So if you start with a scenario where your uh, power plant is emitting one megaton per year and your fuel source is emitting one megaton per year, the pathway that uh, Jean just described is fantastic because it can provide you with a 50% reduction because you've now prevented the fossil fuel CO2 emissions uh, from going into the atmosphere directly. And instead you're providing an opportunity to reuse 
uh, those emissions or to recycle those emissions once. So that's great. It provides you with an opportunity to reduce your emissions. If you move on to a scenario where we capture the CO2 from our flu stacks permanently and safely store that and then also capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and combine it with hydrogen, it provides you with a renewable net zero aligned uh, source of drop-in compatible fuels. Importantly, what this also does is it provides you with a, a vehicle or a carrier for renewable hydrogen, a dramatic demand for end hydrogen that solves the chicken and egg problem. Instead of needing to wait for infrastructure turnover, we can create drop-in compatible fuels by combining that hydrogen with renewable uh, carbon dioxide. You can refine them directly into uh, drop-in compatible fuels like diesel, jet fuel, and gasoline. And as Jean mentioned, the most important parts of this is that there's no conflict with other feedstock needs. You also get a fuel that is superior in performance because it has no sulfur, particulate matter, or aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, we've been in operation uh, at our plant in Squamish. Uh, we've been capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere since 2015. We've been converting it into fuel since 2017. We've produced uh, on-spec diesel. We've also uh, just recently, as part of NRCAN Sky's the Limit project, produced on-spec FTSPK for use as a sustainable aviation fuel. We're in the process of scaling that pilot plant in Squamish up to a full 24-7 uh, operation validation plant uh, that will become our permanent innovation hub going forward. And in parallel to that, we're working together with commercial plant development partners to work on the design and deployment of commercial plants, both uh, the plant that's been announced in the Permian Basin with our partners at 1.5 that will capture up to a million tons per year of atmospheric carbon dioxide and safely and securely store those back underground, as well as commercial scale synthetic fuels plants where our baseline design produces on the order of 100 million liters per year of low carbon fuels. Uh, so with that, I know we're short on time. I will turn it back to you, Killian. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for, for that wonderful and concise presentation. Obviously, the question arises, uh, what's the what's, uh, um, plan for carbon engineering as a company? Do you see yourself more as a, as a producer, as someone who owns plants, or someone who's, um, let's say, putting in a puzzle of the technology um, side? Absolutely. Uh, so we're not naive enough to think that a 120-person company in Squamish, Canada is going to single-handedly deploy uh, sufficient plants uh, around the world in the time that we need uh, to actually meaningfully tackle climate change. So our business model is a licensed process business model. Our expertise is in that capture technology and the ability to integrate that capture technology together with uh, the downstream components to create uh, the most effective integration for production of low carbon fuels. We then work together with licensors or licensees who are uh, plant development partners to deploy that technology around the world. So like the, the partnerships that have already been announced uh, with 1.5 in the United States and Pale Blue Dot in the UK, uh, we expect to have a number of additional partnerships announced in, uh, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you, Anna. Uh, let me then move over to um, the next uh, panelist, uh, uh, Chris Norris from C Siemens Energy. And I think that's a potentially a company that could be a good match for your project, uh, and both offering complementary technology, but also uh, EPC or larger engineering um, expertise. Um, this has been uh, as a track record of 25 years, I think, of background in the energy space and others. And Chris, we're also looking forward to hear from you. Uh, what the future brings for Siemens Energy in terms of hydrogen power fuels and um, what it needs to make a good project. And especially, I think, in um, there's also a link to our next speaker with, uh, with the Haru Oni project in Chile, um, but also many others that you're working on in Europe and around the world. Chris, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I think this is an excellent segue um, to what I wanted to discuss today, which is another one of the components of a successful synthetic fuels uh, project. Uh, carbon dioxide, of course, being one that Anna described. Um, and uh, I mean, the way we see uh, 
E hydrogen, green hydrogen made from electricity, is that it is electrification. And so any source of low carbon electricity is a great uh, source for um, doing all the things that we can do with E hydrogen. And this map just shows a little bit about uh, how we see it. Um, certainly it covers everything from re-electrification that Janice Lynn talked about in her keynote in the exciting uh, IPP project uh, to, re, um, to essentially re-electrification through fuel cells in the mobility space. Uh, there are lots of, lots of other sectors of the economy where hydrogen can, can and does play a role and e-hydrogen can, can be a, a, essentially a drop-in substitute. But of course, what we're talking about today is, is e-fuels production. And between Siemens Energy and uh, Carbon Engineering's carbon dioxide, we have two of the three key components for creating a synthetic fuel. The last is, of course, the Fischer-Tropsch process to, to bring it all together. Um, as the only hydrogen um, e-hydrogen producer here on the panel, I just uh, wanted to take a second to talk about what the electrolyzer looks like. This Feliser 300 is the third generation electrolyzer from Siemens. Uh, what you see here is a 24 module array um, and down below a photograph. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything to scale, but each of these modules is about the size of a refrigerator. A proton exchange membrane stacks about 50 in each module, producing on the order of about 335 kilograms an hour based on 2.5 megawatts. Um, I want to jump, I know we're limited on time and I gather we're going to hear more about this project, but one of the key projects that we're uh, interested in um, in pursuing and are pursuing this year is the project that we call Haruoni in Southern Chile, where we are essentially doing uh, what we just talked about, combining captured carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere with uh, e-hydrogen produced from an electrolyzer combined in a methanol synthesis plant further synthesized into gasoline using renewable uh, power in the form of wind power. And if you're wondering about the location, it really is about the, the availability of wind in that region uh, to produce gasoline for export back to Europe. Um, you know, and uh, as we've heard from Quebec, uh, we have a, an abundance of clean, low carbon electricity in that region. We have Siemens Energy operating in Canada. We've been here for 100 plus years in either in our current form or our predecessor, uh, big Siemens company, um, and really looking for how do we uh, really become a key player uh, and, and contribute towards the power fuels revolution that we're seeing right now. All the ingredients are in place. Hydrogen is an excellent store of energy. It's just difficult to store and move around. Power fuels, there's a tremendous existing demand for liquid hydrocarbons and a tremendous uh, existing infrastructure for storing and moving uh, the hydrocarbon liquids around. Um, we also have a project in Sweden with a company called Liquid Wind. Uh, I won't go into any further details, but it's essentially um, similar to what we're doing in Haruoni, where we're combining uh, carbon dioxide and hydrogen into uh, methanol. Uh, to meet the, the global demand for, for methanol. So with that, I'll just say that Siemens Energy, of course, we've got a tremendous amount of products all across the energy value chain. Um, and what we're looking to do is to continue to um, com combine them in the right proportions to, uh, to meet the demand for decarbonization and power fuels. So with that, I'll just say thanks very much for the invitation to speak and uh, I look forward to any questions. This is excellent. Thank you so much also for, for presenting those projects. And uh, I understand that you are um, working also um, on the use of hydrogen in uh, in the power sector, something Janice alluded to in her presentation as well as a, as a complement for the volatility of uh, renewables. Um, I know it's, it's, it's a bit out of scope of, of what you presented, but um, are, are those, those efforts also somehow linked to, to those projects? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see hydrogen as touching every one of our divisions, every one of our business units. We have the green hydrogen vertical that I've just described around the electrolyzer and the production of hydrogen. But of course, we've got a global deployment of gas turbines, some that are already capable of burning some proportion of hydrogen. And we have a target of all of our uh, gas turbines being 100% uh, hydrogen compliant by 2030. 
So that's an area of tremendous uh, research and development. Um, and looking forward to, uh, to working with our customers on decarbonizing their um, power generation um, resources. Excellent, Chris. It's, uh, it's good to know that you're providing uh, sort of the whole spectrum of solutions here. And as I think also an, an exciting uh, topic to look at the, the gaseous infrastructure and gaseous perspective of power plants. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. We'll now um, move to uh, the, the last speaker of the panel. That's Dr. Tamid Mizan from ExxonMobil. And uh, that's potentially another uh, company that knows how to make big projects uh, take uh, off and get off the ground. So I think also essential in this uh, power fuels revolution, if one may call it that way. Uh, Dr. Tamit Mizan has been working on strategy and regulatory affairs um, for a while now. And uh, Tamit, I will uh, hand it over to you to uh, give us a couple of words um, of introduction towards uh, your activities and maybe also dig deeper on the Haroni project uh, where you as Exxon are a partner as well. Thank you, Killian, and I'd like to thank Dina for the opportunity to participate in the panel. Um, so I'll, I'll get to uh, power fuels and hydrogen in, in just a few minutes, but uh, I'd like to start from a broader uh, perspective, if, you, if I may, uh, of uh, giving you a broad view on low carbon, uh, low carbon technologies in general, and um, specifically what ExxonMobil is doing in this area. So um, just to start off, um, you know, uh, we understand that uh, low carbon fuels such as e-fuels and indeed advanced biofuels as uh, was spoken about earlier, have the potential to combine the convenience of conventional fuels use the existing infrastructure, uh, but also provide lower life cycle greenhouse gas emissions to uh, address uh, society's needs to reduce uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, and these um, uh, low carbon fuels uh, will go in, in, uh, in complement to uh, electrification or battery electric technologies that are out there. Um, E-fuels uh, are uh, one way to do that. I think it's an exciting and uh, technically certainly uh, feasible way to do that. Currently, uh, E-fuels uh, we, we see are expensive, of course, with the current technology and uh, uh, would potentially require regulatory support uh, to become uh, economically viable. So there is a, a policy aspect uh, to uh, how e-fuels uh, progress, of course, and, and that will need to be explored further. Uh, now, e-fuels are being explored um, as a, a potential disposition of renewable electricity. Uh, we heard about the, uh, the uh, Harauni project. And in, in particular, if this renewable electricity is remote from other demand centers, it makes that um, renewable electricity even more attractive uh, to use uh, into or to, to dispose of into e-fuels. Um, of course, uh, we at ExxonMobil are committed to developing uh, transportation technologies that help to reduce environmental impacts and uh, the risks of climate change. Indeed, our CEO um, uh, uh, late last year uh, you know, presented our uh, 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 near-term greenhouse gas plans and, and stated that uh, we respect uh, society's ambitions to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 and continue to advocate for policies that promote cost-effective market-based solutions to address the risks of climate change. We have um, in ExxonMobil um, significant technical experience I think we can bring to bear. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Stukas uh, showed us the different elements, uh, for instance, that need to go into power fuels uh, the, the production of hydrogen, the capture of CO2, and the synthesis of liquid fuels. And we have experience in all of those areas. Um, hydrogen production, indeed, is essential to many of our refineries and, and uh, or, or all of our refineries and chemical plants. And so we've uh, have developed a considerable expertise in that area. Um, we've been a leader um, in the capture of carbon, uh, uh, carbon dioxide and the sequestration of carbon dioxide for more than 30 years. In fact, we have an equity share in about a fifth of the global capacity that exists today for the capture of and sequestration of carbon dioxide. And we've uh, approximately uh, captured 40% all, of all the carbon uh, dioxide, anthropogenic carbon dioxide that's been captured uh, so far. Um, on the fuel synthesis side, um, um, uh, I, I think, uh, um, you know, uh, the Fisher Tropes technology was mentioned. We, we have uh, a proprietary Fisher Tropes te technology of our own that can produce uh, diesel and other uh, types of fuels, and as well as uh, lubricant uh, base stocks and petrochemical feedstocks. 
but more uh, uh, interestingly, we also have a, an additional technology which is called methanol to gasoline, which we commercialized in New Zealand in the 1980s, and and we uh, have that uh, and we license that technology globally, and that's also a a, a critical technology we think to go from um, uh, the, uh, the renewable hydrogen and CO2 to uh, usable fuels on the road. Uh, along those lines, uh, as was mentioned, uh, uh, you know, we are working with our colleagues in Porsche to test uh, both advanced biofuels as well as lower carbon uh, e-fuels as part of an agreement to find pathways uh, towards a potential future consumer adoption of such uh, fuels. Um, indeed, uh, a specially formulated SO uh, renewable racing fuel will be tested on the track in Porsche's high performance motorsports engines, beginning uh, at the Porsche Mobile One Super Cup in 2021. Uh, the first iteration of this fuel will be a blend primarily of advanced biofuels, but the second iteration we expect uh, will include an e fuel. Um, and this will, we expect uh, probably in 2022. And this e fuel will come from uh, the previously referenced Haro Uni project, uh, which uh, we're very, very excited about. Uh, this project is, uh, as um, our Siemens colleague described, is in Chile. And um, it will combine uh, the renewable hydrogen uh, with, with uh, carbon dioxide to produce methanol. Uh, ExxonMobil is very, very proud uh, to be able to provide the uh, conversion technology for that project, the methanol to gasoline conversion technology which will ultimately be made into uh, this uh, race fuel that we talked about uh, a little earlier. So if I may uh, share my screen, Let's see if I can. If you can see that. Dr. Mizan, I was just uh, um, reminding you of, of the time so that uh, we more or less keep, uh, okay. keep within the five. All right, so we'll, we'll, go, we'll go very quickly then. Um, just to uh, show that um, in, in January, uh, ExxonMobil created a new business called ExxonMobil Low Carbon Solutions. And the, the purpose of this, uh, tech, uh, this new company is to uh, invest, uh, uh, we expect up to $3 billion in uh, low carbon, low emissions uh, energy solutions uh, through 2025 and includes uh, different kinds of carbon capture and sequestration projects that you see along the top of the page in, in various uh, countries in the US, in the Netherlands, Belgium, Scotland, Singapore and Qatar are all being evaluated. And then uh, the concepts of hubs was brought up in, the, in reference to green hydrogen. We think the concept of hubs is also appropriate in the context of um, carbon capture and sequestration. In fact, we're looking at a potential carbon capture and sequestration hub in the Houston ship channel where there are lots and lots of industrial emissions. There's a huge uh, reservoir potentially to store uh, the carbon dioxide up to, we believe, 500 billion metric tons of CO, uh, CO2 might be stored in that area in the, um, the Gulf Coast of, uh, uh, of, the, of the United States in uh, near Texas. And uh, we think that um, this project could easily uh, store up to 100 million metric tons of carbon dioxide a year by the year 2040. So this is uh, an area that we're actually very, very excited about. And uh, we expect to, um, you know, leverage all of our technologies to uh, to hopefully bring this to bear. Um, along the bottom of the page, you can see many many partners who we collaborate with in industry, in academia, and in government in terms of carbon capture technologies and other uh, low carbon technologies, including fuel cell, uh, direct air capture, and biofuels technologies. And I think um, we uh, hope to be able to bring all of this technology to bear in terms of reducing the cost and increasing the scale of low carbon solutions, including, of course, uh, uh, potentially uh, hydrogen, uh, low carbon hydrogen and e-fuels. With that, let me stop here and see, Killian, if you have any questions. Thank you, Damit. Excellent overview and it was very impressive, the, the entire track record that you showed here. Uh, there, is a, there is a question and we, we learned from Janice earlier on in her keynote that um, Secretary Granholm announced this new target of making hydrogen cost competitiveness a uh, cost competitive by reducing the cost by 80 percent um now cost competitiveness is i would say in europe not as much a discussion it's more about price competitiveness if you take into account things like carbon prices um would you say this is a feasible objective and uh would you say this is a, a realistic one 
from your so, perspective? Yeah, so I, I think uh, it's important to point out all of the technology collaborations we have at the bottom of the page. Uh, I think uh, technology needs to be brought to bear uh, to help with uh, uh, the cost as well as the scale part of that challenge. And um, you know, different different applications will require different solutions. You know, blue hydrogen, uh, as was referenced, is is kind of the traditional industrial hydrogen uh, with car carbon capture uh, uh, bolted onto it. Uh, that's one option that uh, is probably deployable in large scale, uh, with a cost intermediate to gray hydrogen and, and green hydrogen. Uh, green hydrogen, on the other hand, may be appropriate for a different scale of application. Uh, and of course, uh, all of these require additional uh, technology uh, to make them uh, more and more uh, competitive. Uh, I think uh, early on and maybe um, uh, for a significant amount of time, a policy support will be required to commercialize them. Uh, I think uh, it will be difficult to see um, many of these technologies stand alone without uh, good a uh, policy framework in place. And I expect most of the, my colleagues on the panel will agree with that. Thanks, Tamid. And I would like to, to exactly uh, get those panelists back on our virtual stage and um, would like also to, to give you uh, the opportunity of uh, one double comment in a way. <laughs> First to, to Jean Paca again. Uh, policy support is difficult. Uh, what are the measures, especially in the international market that uh, aviation is working with? Um, what's the one single policy tool, if you could uh, put that on a wish list, um, that you would need to, to make that business case really work on full scale? And second question, um, how can other regions benefit also from your project or maybe you know uh, contribute a demand elsewhere in, in, in the world can contribute to the SAF plus a project, John, if you could allude to that very quickly. Oh, first question, uh, policy. Thank you very much for that, uh, Kilian. First, first question on policy. Well, it's, it's, it's all about coming back to what I mentioned before. It's all about being in a new sector um, of activity, a new, a new development where uh, Germany, for instance, is a good example on uh, wind power. Uh, it all had the uh, subsidies around the uh, FIP projects, for instance. Well, uh, that policy wasn't uh, just born out of thin air. It was, it was actually a government putting together, uh, you know, dollars uh, uh, contributing for, um, uh, for this matter of, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with people's uh, uh, money and incentives into, into, and subsidies into building and putting together that project uh, in that new sector of activity. So it needs a kickstart. Uh, it needs a it needs it needs a support. So what I would, of course, uh, put in terms of policy uh, would be to uh, actually uh, subsidize and support uh, clean uh, development, clean fuel development uh, in in Canada. We are currently in discussion, very uh, active discussion with the government. Uh, they at both level here in Canada, we have a, a provincial uh, government uh, for Quebec and a federal government for Canada. And at both level, we're talking. And what well, the good thing we're seeing about it. And, and of course, not criticizing as opposed to uh, uh, to other areas where I've seen there's no there's no move forward. What we're noticing here is that both government actually align with that policy. It actually makes sense for them to look into solutions to help and support this kind of industry and development. So that would be that would be the first one. And the second question uh, on if, if I remember well on geographically where which other areas would benefit from that. Is that correct, Kellyan? Yeah, exactly. Who could also, uh, which uh, off-takers would you consider outside of Canada? Would you even? Yeah, well, in our case, in our case, and as Anna's, uh, as Anna's mentioned before, the, the combination of the intake and the actual feedstock, the CO2 in this case, is, is uh, directly dependent on industries. In our case, we need to be beside um, a large uh, industrial areas for capture. Uh, you can always have an air capture and put it almost anywhere, which is, which is all fine. The real issue here is energy, and it's green energy for that matter in Canada. Um, and Mathieu mentioned it uh, earlier on um, from the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources in Canada and Montreal and Quebec. We have, we're blessed with a, uh, any, even in BC for that matter, and some other areas in Canada, you're blessed with this renewable green energy. And there's a potential for actually 
uh, amortizing or making this project, this kind of project, a beneficial one and a sustainable one. So I would say areas where you have access to renewable energy, uh, such as California, Quebec, uh, BC, and other areas in the world uh, where you have large amount of uh, a, a renewable energy is, is to be considered in that equation, especially for our project. Thank you, Jean. And uh, I can just affirm from the European and German perspective, there is a huge interest in offtake. In Germany, there's a debate about uh, a mandate for, for power to liquids in aviation that we're surely aware of. And I think yep. that will uh, drive a lot of demand. Now, there are two more questions also from the audience towards uh, Chris and Anna, and that I think is more on the side of scaling technology. Uh, Chris, uh, the question, one question was put out for you. What is actually possible? Is, is um, production of electrolyzers the bottleneck that we can expect? And how fast can you ramp up production? Well, that's certainly an area of concern for us, especially when, um, you know, the, 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 the demand for electrolyzers, the talk about projects, um, you know, is, it, is at a frenzied pace right now. Um, and the deployment um, is soon to follow. Um, so we have the capacity to build uh, in the range of 250 to 400 megawatts of electrolyzers currently, and that's our plant operating right now in Erlangen, Germany. Um, we can ex certainly, uh, in short order, extend shifts, and we are also developing a gigafactory also in Germany um, that will be scalable to meet market demand well in excess of, of gigawatt scale. I mean, the projects that we're talking about here um, you know, we talked in the in the preamble a little bit about uh, you know like a pocket uh, electrolyzer for for you know large, small scale demand. But Siemens Energy is looking at 20 megawatts essentially as its smallest deployment, and then on the order of two, four, six hundred megawatt deployments. So we really are looking very large scale. Uh, the capacity to build these things is a key part of our strategy moving forward, and it's something that we're definitely addressing. Exciting, Chris, and uh, good to know that uh, this is on the line and hopefully well on track to, to match the demand for hydrogen projects. Uh, now, I would pose a similar question to Anna, and the uh, question has also been already touched upon in the chat. Um, what's the time frame that you will be ready to, to offer licensing? But I think also the general question is, um, how fast could that then ramp up production? Um, I know cost is also of a concern for direct air capture, and you have put out ambitious price targets, if I remember correctly, of around $100 uh, dollars per ton in the long term. Um, but can we keep pace in terms of building the necessary capacity? Absolutely. Those are, are great questions. And, you know, when it comes to the question of how quickly can we deploy, uh, that's exactly why we want to work with partners like 1.5 and Pale Blue Dot that have the, the capacity and the ability to help us scale quickly and faster. When it comes to our technology itself, one of the critical things that we did in selecting our technology design was rather than to start with something at a laboratory scale and see how big we could make it, we looked out into existing industry to find pieces of existing industrial equipment and existing industrial processes that we could combine together in a novel fashion to make our process. So our process was designed from the very beginning to be deployed at large industrial scales. This is why we're confident in our ability to go directly from our innovation center in Squamish all the way up to a million ton per year plant in the Permian Basin. Uh, it's that design principle and the focus on industrial precedence that allows us to get there. That's also what gives us a high level of confidence in our technology costs, uh, both today and as part of the cost town roadmap. Uh, so we believe that the combination of those two things really positions us well in terms of, of scaling largely. Uh, the other key piece that I would note is that the number one driving factor in the cost of producing power fuels is the cost of your renewable electricity. And as the cost of renewable electricity comes down, we're able to capitalize on that. The cost of capturing the carbon dioxide is actually a very small fraction of the overall cost of producing power fuels. So you could look at the cost of that CO2 doubling even and only having a 10% impact on the overall purchase price of your power fuels. 
So we see, and as Jean mentioned as well, the number one driving factor in where you would site these plants commercially worldwide is by going and looking for the most cost-effective deployment of renewable electricity. So locations like British Columbia and Quebec are ideal, California, Texas, where you're seeing huge proliferation of both wind and solar with very impressive uptime factors when you combine that wind and solar together in the neighborhood of 80% capacity factors. Uh, so that's really, really quite exciting for us. You know, five or 10 years ago, it would have been unheard of to think that you could get renewable electricity for less than $20 a megawatt hour. And today uh, it's absolutely a commercial reality. And that's really driving the feasibility of these um, products going forward. Thank you, Anna, for, for those optimistic news. And I think uh, that uh, possibly also concludes our, our first panel discussion. And as usual, I'm, um, I'm very sad that we just had so little time because uh, we really had representatives from the entire value chain that could uh, make a project probably of its own happen uh, in its very own right in the North American space. I would like to thank you all um, very warmly, uh, Chris, Anna, uh, Tamit and Jean for, for joining us for the panel. What we want to attempt, attempt here is something very important, and that is telling the others what we discussed in our respective uh, breakout sessions. And I know that's always a bit, it can drag on <laughs> towards the end of such a wonderful conference. So I want to ask you to keep it short and state again, what was your research question or main discussion question, and maybe two or three points that you took out from the breakout session that um, maybe uh, or maybe new points that you've learned in the discussion today. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to uh, to start with that uh, since I, that was the uh, group where I know that the head is already here, uh, Jack Jack Brow from, from UCI. Would you mind starting, please? Sure, I'll start and try to be brief. Um, it was a lively discussion. Uh, we talked about introducing aviation fuels in particular um, and um, Ari from the Netherlands um, had a very nice um, suggestion at the beginning of the discussion to mandate a certain blending standard. Um, and uh, that was followed by discussions of both engendering that mandate by a federal policy and engendering bottom up support from the general public who wants to travel again after COVID, but wants to do so sustainably and will start to demand it if appropriate education and outreach is accomplished to um, engender those characteristics. We talked a little bit about how it could be mandated um, internationally, and there were some ideas um, that were provided uh, with regard to how that might be done. Um, so I thought it was a very nice discussion, and that was the main, those were the main points that we talked about. Thank you, Jack, for that concise overview. Very interesting. I will now restore back the order uh, of, uh, of things and move to Eric Larson from Princeton University. Eric, what was the main question and the two or three points that shaped your discussion in the work records? Sure, uh, thanks. Uh, we, uh, we also had a nice discussion. We covered a couple of different things. The, um, a lot of focus on how do we get, what, what do we need to do in the, in the very near term to get uh, to a longer term hydrogen vision? Um, and the ideas that were, that was one of the areas we discussed quite a bit. And the ideas were that we need to standardize, need a common language. Um, we need pilot, uh, more pilot demonstrations and, and scalable demonstrations. Um, the idea of hydrogen hubs, which um, evidently is quite, um, is going quite aggressively in Europe, um, maybe less so in North America. And that, that could be a, an area of emphasis. Um, um, and and uh, um, Thorsten, I think it was wrapped it up nicely in terms of what, where to focus uh, focus on the the areas where it will be difficult to decarbonize, like jet fuel, for example, and focus on using existing infrastructure, like in in hubs, um, as a way of getting started. The the, the one other topic that we uh, got onto a bit was the. Um, um, the question of whether electricity should be used for um, uh, for P to P to X versus direct electrification, 
um, and you know was one more efficient than the other, and so on. Um, and ultimately, the, there was a little there was back and forth on it, but ultimately it came down to you know what what uh, is going to have the biggest impact in terms of reducing CO two emissions, and that that needs to be uh, sort of verified and justified in terms of which you know which side of the fence you sit on, whether electrification or P two X is better. So that's uh, my uh, the one other point I'll just add is that um, as the the P2X opportunity exists for countries that are not now um, exporting energy exporters to become major players in the energy uh, field in the longer term, um, uh, sort of a bit the way Chile is starting to you know show an example of how how they can use resources locally to really um, not only meet their own needs, but then be able to become exporters. Thank you, Eric, for those, uh, yeah, those interesting points as well. And this very global outlook of your discussion, that's, uh, that's good to hear. Um, I will now um, move, before I move on to Gabriel Durani, uh, I understand that Jack has a short comment and I would uh, give him the opportunity to do that. Yes, I just wanted, I forgot to mention two important topics that we discussed. One was environmental justice and a just transition, which fortunately is being discussed by many policymakers nowadays with regard to transitioning away from fossil and into renewable and zero emissions. Um, the second aspect that we discussed is energy resilience and the ability to meet both thermal and electrical demands, okay? either via just wires, and it's related directly to Eric's uh, comment here, either via just wires, or should we both decarbonize the gas system and the electric system? So this question came up also in our discussion today. Thanks, Jack. And uh, we will now uh, add um, the, um, Gabriel Durani, who had it another breakout session. Gabriel, again, what was the main question that you tackled or how did it evolve? And what are the two or three points that you would like to share? Well, thank you uh, for the, the opportunity. The breakout session number two was, was titled Policy and Technology Drivers for Power Fuels Demand Across Sectors. So it's a long title, but what we focused on really was, well, policy, <laughs> policy drive, you know, how to drive this, this, uh, this arrival of green, you know, green hydrogen. And, and so we started, I think, the whole discussion, um, Melanie and I, by just, you know, putting forward the fact that what we are basically working on right now is to replace gray hydrogen that is being produced at very low cost with a product which is called green hydrogen or renewable hydrogen, which is at a higher cost. And at the very beginning of this workshop, we had a, you know, Janice Lynn that said basically that, you know, cost is sometimes difficult to beat and we need to establish true policy, you know, a way to, to uh, a new equilibrium in that discussion. And so, I mean, by trying, when we had that discussion, we focused a lot on a mechanism that would structure the demand, uh, whether they're injection blending targets for RNG or biofuels um, or others. And then we looked also at mechanism that could, you know, put a price on GHG emission reduction, whether it's like, you know, there, there are many examples of such mechanism, whether they're Rex, RIN, uh, and others, uh, LCFS credit. Uh, it's not the name that is important, but really the mechanism and that the discussion needs to focus on that because we need to bring the money that comes from carbon markets or carbon taxes to users and producers to foster higher production, which, which brings us to a third and fourth subject, which was discussed, and I'd like to let Melanie, you know, add on what I said if I forgot something. But the third and fourth subject had to do with, you know, the importance of building a roadmap in order to prioritize action for for policymakers, uh, the importance of, you know, embedding such roadmaps and strategies to make sure that we understand, you know, what will come at least first, and then <laughs> maybe second. Um, and the fourth element is really the industrial strategy. So a strategy that includes a roadmap and also an industrial strategy, because it's all about scaling up. It's all about building to scale this, this production of green hydrogen. And so it brings a lot of question about, you know, hubs, production hubs, 
or tax credit for production or et cetera, et cetera. Industrial strategy was perhaps the fourth subject we discussed. With that, I think I'm done and I'll let Melanie uh, add uh, the point I've missed because I'm sure I did. So thank you very much everyone. Thank you, uh, no, I, uh, Gabriel, I think you hit everything very well. And um, I would just add, I'm glad that Jack brought up the equity and justice issue um, that also came up in our session. And it's going to be increasingly important in the United States. It's critical. And it's a great reason to decarbonize our, uh, our energy system because it's better for communities. It's better for our air and environment. Um, it creates the potential for good local green jobs. And we can repurpose a lot of our infrastructure and existing jobs um, and increase training and opportunities with this sector. So it's really a win-win on that front. Thanks, Melanie. And I think we're just missing uh, Mathieu for uh, a wrap up of the whole session. Yeah, so our session was on uh, certification in relation to green hydrogen and the, 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 the scope and everything that goes with it. So there was a lot of, of, of great thought about uh, what is uh, the, the objective of such of having such a, a certification that for for, for one thing. So if we need to identify the correct objective for such a tool, because uh, by itself it doesn't uh, ma makes much sense if it's not in the context. So uh, as far as the objective, uh, I think one of the major elements that came uh, that came into the discussion was the the price for re renewable. So it's basically it would be basically a tool to try to uh, uh, motivate a, a higher cost for energy. Um, but of course, there's a lot of, of issues that goes with such a, a certification when we think about uh, low emission hydrogen or, or, or trying to figure out uh, category, categories for uh, hydrogen. Um, of course, there's some links to be done from what I've heard uh, with the third breakout session on market and, and the cap and trade systems and stuff like that. So I think that that uh, it's kind of a, an overall kind of, kind of thing. Um, in relation to the scope of the certification, uh, there was this point that was made that um, the certification should be looking at the, the hydrogen uh, at the end use. Uh, and so in order for that to, to happen, we of course have to look at the, the, the transport, um, uh, the way of transport, uh, transporting the hydrogen. For instance, if there is uh, some exportation uh, on a uh, on boats, uh, which is emitting a lot of GHG, well, even if the production of uh, of hydrogen was conceived as being green, green uh, well, can we still assume that the hydrogen is still green? Mm -hmm. Then goes for uh, for electricity. So uh, there is this issue to have even some kind of. Uh, uh, consensus about what is green electricity. Uh, so of course, if we cannot manage to do that, how can we uh, succeed in doing the same for uh, hydrogen? Um, a final uh, element I want to point out, perhaps the idea of how can we uh, succeed in having some kind of international uh, recognition. So a certification that would be uh, applicable either in Europe and in North America or or in Asia or anywhere else in, in the world. Uh, seems that ISO uh, standards would be the, probably the way to go. But then again, it's kind of a consensus-based uh, uh, structure. So uh, a lot of, of, of issues to be, uh, to be done in the, uh, on this side as well. So that's pretty much the wrap up I would uh, suggest. Thank you, Mathieu, and uh, thank you also, Eric, uh, Jack, and Gabriel, for the wrap up of the session. And I think that really demonstrates uh, the entire scope of the discussions that we have, which is very broad in the end. Um, I think uh, what we've seen and established over the course of the discussion today is that uh, power fuels are somewhat indispensable for a wholesome energy transition that addresses climate neutrality as a core which is now the new political consensus. And therefore, what we need now is strategies and uh, really to address um, the underlying problems that uh, still bring us closer to scale. And we've learned that physical scale does not seem to be um, 
an unsurmountable bottleneck uh, from the technology providers. Um, we heard that. We heard that there exist ideas on policies and on effective policies that we can use, where we can also maybe learn from each other in the European and North American spheres. And we've learned about the partnerships that already exist in business and making projects happen and in potentially establishing global supply chains for this, which is, I think, a very exciting uh, stage uh, where we're at right now. Um, in a way, the start, I think, also of increased um, European North American discussions, I hope. Uh, we certainly, as the Global Alliance, are ready to uh, see this more as a starting point. Um, of cooperation and um, therefore I would also like to extend an invitation for our annual conference again Mr. Kuhlmann our CEO mentioned that um, on uh, June 23rd uh, inviting you to join we will be talking about connecting power fuels hubs and I think that was mentioned several times uh, today um, with that um, let me close today's events um, I think we could wrap up for 10 minutes more, but I'm afraid we don't have the time for that. So uh, let me say thank you for all of you who joined, who took out the time and uh, let's stay in touch and uh, let's drive those issues forward in the future. And we hope to work together closely on this. Thank you all from Berlin and uh, sending greetings. Bye. Thank you.